Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, this last study, morning study of this week relating to Daniel chapter 11, Daniel's last vision. And um, we're going to be looking more into Raphia, Daniel 11, 11. But before we do, can you join me in the word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the study this morning. You can bring us together to open your word. And we invite your spirit to speak to us directly, uh, to guide us in our day-to-day -day life, in our understanding of your word, and in the way that we share these things with others. We pray for those that we have contact with and that we have been sharing these things. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can bring a conviction and power in the lives of all who are searching for truth. You can reveal to us our need of you, and that we can learn to trust in you with our lives. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> not many people here yet today, um, but um, we're looking at Daniel chapter 11 and the last couple of studies, we sort of did an overview of Daniel 11, and it, and it came up in, in studying Daniel 11, uh, that a brother from Romania has directed me to Chalatu and Kimberly's studies that they presented uh, six years ago, 2017, um, on Daniel chapter 11. It might have been, you know, I'm not, at least that's when they were posted some sometime probably in 2017. Um, now, I'd never seen them before, and I've been watching them, and there's definitely some differences that they have. And one of the ways we explain this is it seems pretty obvious that Chowatu and Kimberly, back in 2017, didn't understand about what was going to happen. That is, they didn't understand how history was going to unfold in this movement. And so they obviously can't look at and consider many of the things that we are considering, and especially when it comes to understanding the application to our time. So, so it's not a criticism of, of Chawa to in saying, well, there's some mistakes that he made, some things he didn't notice, and some, some things we would disagree with. Um, I'm going to try to to finish watching all of them and give a summary of on some of the differences and there are some interesting points that he brings up. Um, one has to do with the agreement that we had um, in uh, verse um, 6, and that agreement, which is made in 252, and then uh, another date connected with it in 246 BC. So those things we need to consider as well. So there are some symbolic numbers here we haven't actually considered. And those actually do help us interpret the text in its application to our time in ways that Chawatu and Kimberly could not have noticed. Um, now, if you remember, I had added up, uh, we had looked at some of these uh, Hebrew numbers, and we used them as sort of keys to, to affirm what we were interpreting as far as its application to our time. Um, so we use these numbers in various ways. And one of the things we looked at yesterday is just, I couldn't remember which verse it ended up to 23,111. Of course, that's Daniel 11.9. Um, and the significance there, of course, is 23,111. Um, its divisors are 11 times, well, its factorization is 11 times 11 times um, 191. So, so having uh, those symbols, 1111 and 191, in connection with a verse that deals with 11.9 um, or 9.11, and going back to Dwight's study in the summer, brings all those things together. Now, another verse, which I just noticed, you know, 10, 15 minutes ago, maybe, maybe less, is I added up uh, all the Hebrew numbers in Daniel 11, 11. I wanted to see well, what are those, what, what would the number be? And 
as soon as I did it, I was kind of, well, that's really close to a number that I know. And if we go back to our study in the book of Judges, uh, we had uh, taken, um, what we had done is we had taken, so I'll, I'll just do the math here and you can see what I'm talking about. We had taken, uh, it's actually not the book of Judges, it's before the book of Judges, but in that in that history when you were studying um, understanding the lines. And we had taken the covenants with Abraham. So we know that in chapter 12, um, we're going to have Abraham first have this coven covenant, right? And then you're going to have chapter 15, where the covenant, covenant is ratified, cut the covenant. And then we're going to have... Um, verse chap chapter 17 and then we're going to have chapter 22 and we get this number 67,320 now the interesting thing about this number is if you divide it by 187 you get 360 or you could say if you divide it by 360 it's a number that represents 187 prophetic years and at that time I also was looking at this date, April uh, 5th, uh, 2030, which is 67,920 days from the first day of the first month in 1844 to the first day of the first month, April 2030. So that would be uh, 187 years and 20 months. Now, in adding together... Uh, these numbers uh, from Daniel 11, 11. I'm just going to uh, bring you to just here. It's just so you can see it. You might not be able to see it very well. Um, but here are the verses here. So these are the words. There's 15 words in that verse, Daniel 11, 11. These are the Hebrew numbers. And you may not be able to be able to see it down in the corner here because it's pretty tiny, but it gives a sum of all of these. And I could probably just do this, click on here and go. Uh, auto sum. And you can see the number is 67,340. So compared to the number 67,320, which is that number of 187 prophetic years, you can see this number is 187 prophetic years and 20 days. So is that significant that we find this in Daniel 11.11? 11? Most certainly. Okay. Yeah, so we have connected in these, these 2,300 months as well is 27,000, uh, um, uh, 67,920 days is 2,300 months. Um, so this is obviously related to that, the 187, um, and in that case, it's going to be 187 years and 20 months, uh, 100, or 186, 187th year and 20 months. Anyway. Uh, 187 years. So it's going to be 187 prophetic years and 20 prophetic months. And it's going to be 67,920 is 186 prophetic year or 186 literal years. So April 5th, 2030 marks 180, the start of the 187th year. And so we now have again symbols related to that in Daniel chapter 11. So, so we have this significance, the symbol of 18720, 187 prophetic years and 20 days in this case. So why is that here in Daniel 1111? I know we don't have a lot of people here who usually discuss out loud. Um, some of you might write in the comments. In the chat. Um, 
we have this significance. So Daniel 1111 relates to the symbol of raphia. And of course, we know that's going to start our line. So Dwight, you, you just got here. Right. Okay. So I added up the Hebrew numbers in Daniel 1111. All right. It comes to 67,340, which is exactly 187 prophetic years of 360 days and 20 days. All right. Interesting. Because yeah, remember when we went back and we added up the chapters in which the covenants with Abraham were made? <clears throat> right. That's 67,320. And we found that that was exactly 187 prophetic years. And 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 then we had um, that number with uh, 2,300 months, which was 67,920 days. Right. Which is... 187 prophetic years and 20 months and now we have here uh, 187 years and 20 days symbolized by 67,340 days so just 20 days more than and so I asked the question what's the significance of finding this here in Daniel 11 11 because we know this is a symbol of raphia or it is raphia but it's a symbol in our history with uh, November 9th, 2019. We could also connect it with uh, um, January 6th, 2021. So, I mean, we would have to say it's significant, right? The no it's, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I didn't expect to find anything by adding the verses together. Maybe I should be more uh, confident adding these Hebrew numbers together from this verse. Um, and I just figured it out just before the study. So, um, so we're placing it here at this verse, which is Raphia. And we know that that date, November 9th, 2019, is going to begin this period of 777 days. And that period okay. of 777 days has one of the keys to it is 252 days from the start of that date november 9th 2019 is july 18 2020 which is of course was our main message uh through to the end of 2019 into uh the middle of 2020 right that was our, our message for this movement that symbol and the 18720 has showed up in different ways obviously name lamech taking the gematria of his name and multiplying uh the the letters right instead of just adding them you get 18720 and so there's so many different ways so now we have it with daniel 1111 and and so we can tie it to our history so we were saying yesterday that i'm i'm looking at these verses in their cosmic scope that is we're not we're not going to say that daniel 1111 has already happened. That is, we think that this is midnight and it's something we're approaching, yet we do have tied it to November 9th, 2019, especially in context, context, context of the pandemic and the prediction made regarding the pandemic. Um, and of course, the pandemic happens between those dates, November 9th, 2019 and July 18, 2020. Um, so now we have this, uh, this symbol of Rafi and we're saying this is future, but we still have attached to this verse, July 18, 2020 as a symbol, just by looking at the Hebrew numbers and, and the chances of that occurring randomly. I mean, we could say, well, there could be other numbers that these could add up to that, you know, might be significant, but when you're dealing with such a large number. There isn't a lot of numbers that can be as significant as 18720, right? I would agree. Yeah. So so we have to take this as God saying something to us. Now, as far as the cosmic scope of, of how I look at 
raphi and pineum. So what we talked about yesterday was um, near the end of the study was the idea that we're 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 looking too um, our focus is too close right now in trying to apply raphi and pineum. That is, if we think that raphia was January. 6 2021 and pineum is just the republican response to that which is eventually going to lead to the sunday law in the united states that doesn't really make sense to me when we look at jeff's line about 9 11 midnight midnight cry the sunday law with midnight and midnight cry being raffi and pineum that that's not as cosmic in scope as what we see happening worldwide and so the question is um, there's a number of questions, but one of them, if it's true that this is cosmic in, in scope and the king of the South is not just a nation, but actually an ideology, and the king of the North here represents the ideology of the king of the North, of apostate Protestantism, and that there is a um, spiritual battle going on between these two powers, right? a, a philosophical battle in which the king of the South first wins, and then the king of the north defeats them. We, we could say that that has already been going on for a long time. The king of the south has been conquering the king of the north, if we're taking them as ideologies, correct? If that makes sense to people. I would think I can agree with that. I just have to really consider what you're saying. So, because when we have been marking dates, we've been marking dates with events, right? Either, either, you know, symbolically pointing to events, and then after those dates have passed, we can see that there are events, and those events are the things we see in the news, right? right. Um, but it would be much more difficult, I think, to say, well, the King of the South conquering the king of the north, what kind of event that would be, um, especially if it's more a philosophical battle. I mean, we might be able to find some kind of way mark or some kind of event that sort of is, okay, that that definitely symbolizes this happening. And, you know, and somebody could say, well, we could use January 6, 2021 as that. And, you know, definitely in the United States, and, and we could say, you know, this is pointing to this battle that is much more philosophical. Even though there is an event that marks it, it's, it marks a change in the United States and really a change in the world overall. That this philosophy and, and you know, we could talk about wokeism, but it's really communistic. It's really uh, spiritualistic, right? You know, we could give it lots of different labels. It's, it's globalism. But behind it all is a power that we would call the dragon power. Right? Okay. Agreed. Like false prophet. And so so maybe we can say, you know, that event could be symbolized by what happened in the United States. And we could say that it's in connection with our lines. And we could put it on a date, you know, could put that date on a line symbolically. Um and then at some point, there would be some other event that would symbolically show that this shift has, has occurred where the philosophy of apostate Protestantism, which is going to bring in the Sunday law, has, has conquered, right? So I'm not saying January 6th is, is the best date. It's a date we have now. But that would much more relate to the Republican and Democrat battle going on in the United States between the North and the South, right? the North being Republican, the South being Democrat. And that would go back to the Civil War uh, that happened um, in the 1860s, where we have that uh, conflict, right? Which is a type of this Civil War that's occurring now in the United States. And that uh, the seven kings that we've been studying uh, in Revelation 17 that those seven kings where we can say, well, you know, Biden is the one that is and the seventh is the next president and he's going to be the president of the civil war. 
would still fit into that scenario, even if there ended up being other presidents. Um, the, sim the, 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 the role of those seven kings is a specific period in American history, a false prophet, where ultimately um, that Republican horn falls, right? And it's symboled in this period of time from 1989 to 2025 or whatever. And, and that would still fit within that whole scenario. I know it's a lot of things to think about, but I, I can't, I, I shouldn't say I can't, but to me, it's difficult to see the idea that what's happening right now in the United States is those exact final events that we're looking for. That is the Sunday lock, since there are so many things that we know prophetically have to occur. And especially in regards to this movement, the role that it has to take in giving this message first to the Seventh-day Adventist church and then to the world. And so if you're saying the Sunday law is coming, you know, with the next president, um, we have a movement that hardly even knows, you know, its right hand from its left hand. And... Uh, is is very divided and has not done the work that it's supposed to do. And, you know, things, of course, the last events can be rapid ones. There could be lots of things that can help speed that up. But a crisis is only going to demonstrate our character, not develop it. So, so I still think, this is me thinking, that we have a lot more to do. And we also have these symbolic dates that are in the future. We have the this extension of time. We've made an application for the additional extension of time as far as following, uh, uh, filing our taxes, right? That, uh, that number that we found on November 24th last year, um, which I can't remember what it is, but a lot of numbers. But here we have... Daniel 11, 11, and we can connect it to our history, right? And so we can say, well, maybe we're just taking Daniel 11, 11, and we're just going to, it's going to start at, you know, uh, 11, 9, 19, and it's just going to illustrate our history, but it is something that's still future. Or, uh we can just say, well, all of this is still future in a sense, but we're we're in the midst of it, right? So we have we have a choice. We can either say, well, it's just we have three choices that I'm putting before you. So we have a choice where Daniel eleven eleven, that's Raphia, that's January sixth, twenty twenty one, or even November 9th, two thousand nineteen. We say, you know, however we want to look at, it. somebody's going to put it at some date in the past, and it's going to Paneum is going to be. A response. So if it's January 6, 2021, then the response is this election coming up, right? That's the Republican response. They win the election. They defeated the King of the North, defeated the King of the South. We have Paneum, and we're going to have the Sunday law following soon after that, right? So we have that choice. We have a choice where we can say, no, this raffia is something still way in the future. It's, um, you know, it's cosmic in scope. It doesn't really particularly relate to what's happening in the United States today, other than in a general sense. Um, that That is what's happening today is typifying what's going to happen in the future. And that's sort of what I proposed uh, yesterday. But we do have another way, if we look at this in this sort of cosmic way, that we can say that this is already anchored Raffi is already anchored in our lines, right? Um, and that um, it's not just about the United States, but it still has started in our history. That is, we, we zoom into this Raffia, and it's going to include dates in our history and dates in the future that are just symbolic that we don't know if they are fulfilled in that time. But yet this is much more 
not about you know Russia and the United States or um, you know countries fighting against each other. Definitely, we're not going to have anything to do with having to do with what's going on in Israel. Uh, you know, we're not going to take um, those types of futuristic views. But uh, but uh, out of these three, if I've you know explained them well, I don't know. But what what is the most sensible? What is the most consistent with what we have found when we studied the Book of Judges, and and previously? <clears throat> We have the symbol of July 18, 2020, right here in Daniel 11, 11. You know, we also have the last word in the verse, which is 3027, which we can see March 27th in there. So, and 273. Yeah, yeah, the 273. Yeah. So, so the question is, are we going to say that Raphia in this context has already started and that that it's that we're seeing the king of the south defeating the king of the north i would say that that's a better application than trying to make this a <clears throat> defined point in time that it's already occurred we, we do have some symbolic dates in which we can connect it. That is, we can take our 777 structure and just say that whole structure is really representing this cosmic conflict between these two philosophies. That That's the start of it. That's Raphia, in a sense, in our history. Because we could say... Um, you know, that, um, so the king of the south is going to come with anger, right? But the king of the north sets forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. Notice the word multitude doubled there, right? Um, the 1995 uh, Hebrew number. Right. Okay. And, and we could say, well, that marks... Midnight, right? That marks Matt Raphia, right? There's actually quite a few doublings in here. Like when I looked at uh, the Hebrew numbers, the uh, the ones that are doubled, I'm just going to be a sort. So we got 1995 is doubled. Uh, 44428 is doubled. 5973 is doubled. Right? So you got three different words that, that are, are twice in this verse. So out of the 15 verses, you know, there's six six words that are are pairs. You know, there's three pairs, of, so six words together. And that leaves nine other words that aren't doubled. So that's you know, that's something you would generally expect to see okay so i have an odd question yeah if i step back for a second and i go to daniel 11 9 that's before us on the screen yeah and the last portion that we're talking about this and i believe that this is in reference to the king of the south yeah the verse states and shall return into his own land. The Hebrew word for land or soil here has the same digits as midnight. Right, yeah, which we noted before. So at its is um, one, two, seven Hebrew. So is this giving us... Yeah, okay, go on. Is this giving us another... Um, piece of evidence that Daniel 11, 11 or Raphia yeah. is a period rather than a point. Right. And that's kind of the, the point. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. So one thing here is we know that Daniel 11, 9, if we add the Hebrew numbers up in that verse, okay. it's 20,111, which is 11 times 11 times 191, right? So, so we have these two verses where we can add up the digits and we get these very significant numbers. One that ties us to 11, 9, one that ties us to July 18, 2020. But what we were looking before, looking for before was, okay, we want Rafi. Rafi is going to be November 9th, 2019. And, and then we said, well, Paniam's July 18, 2020. Right. That's how we looked at it. And the pandemic occurs in between those two periods, just like Jeff says. So we have uh, confirmation of Rafi and Paniam. But of course, we tried to say, because of what we expected Rafi to be, this battle between the, the North and the South, that would be the United States and uh, Russia. Um, those things which were first predicted, Jeff, prior to those dates, said, no, those events are not going to happen. And and they didn't, right? Now, we did, of course, later get a proxy war between the United States and Russia, so to speak, with what's happening in the Ukraine. So, you know, so some people just say, well, this is just delayed in some way. But but I'm taking the position that Russia is not the king of the south, that, that the king of the south moved from Russia to the UN. It's It's this idea of the globalists. And then we can see in our history that we have the, the when we go to Daniel 11, 11, the king of the north, he sets forth a great multitude. But the multitude shall be given into the hand of the king of the south, right? And, and we can see if we think about Xerxes as Trump, Xerxes stirs up all against the realm of Grisha, Right. But he, he's he's going to lose. And and so we can see that this is kind of what happened with Trump. He stirred up a great multitude. But he's going to lose his. You know, make America great again. Is that what it is? Make America great again, MAGA. Right. That's going to to fail. But, and. And it fails because partly, I think the biggest factor was the pandemic, um, just because of of how it changed the voting system. That, you know, if it wasn't for the mail-in ballots, there's no doubt that Trump would have won that election. And and uh, those mail-in ballots, you know, one of the things about uh, the left, the voters in the left, this, this is true in Canada with the New Democratic Party, the Socialist Party in Canada, is uh, they're very lazy and they don't get out to vote. So you have to make it really easy for them to vote. And, you know, we know that with mail-in ballots, you can have people collecting ballots and mailing them for them, helping them out. So the people who aren't quite as lazy, more activist types, uh, can get a lot more votes out. Plus, of course, rep dead Republicans are going to vote uh, Democrat. So, um, and that makes it easier for them to do so. So you have all of these factors. Um, and so we could say, well, in this whole situation, in this line, in this history that we have, this is Raphia. It's going to be the king of the north setting forth a great multitude, but the king of the south moves with collar against the king of the north. And and the king of the north here, you know, we could say, well, this is, you know, Republicans, but it's not just Republicans. It's really Protestant America. It's this apostate Protestant America. It's not a very religious Protestant America, but it's certain values that are hold, held that are definitely in opposition to those that the king of the south holds, that atheism, communism, globalism, all those different isms hold. And, and so that could be represented in our history. So these things all overlap, just like when we, we zoom in, we can create a line and that line is going to be, you know, have some of the same dates, but some of them, the, some of these lines are more specifically dealing with like Democrats and Republicans within the United States. 
but they're symbolizing what's happening on a broader scale and they exist within that same time. So we don't have to look for midnight as some event in the future. In a sense, we can kind of say we're in it in this in this context. But it's 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 still not this simple um, thing where we just look for one date that marks you know midnight coming. Midnight, in a sense, we could say, just like the Sunday law. The Sunday law is an event on the line that Ellen White has. But we're in the time of the Sunday law. We, we don't have the Sunday law yet, but 9-11 marks the start of that Sunday law. It's progressive. And so what we would be saying is that midnight or raffia is a progressive way mark. It, it can be marked on different dates within, you know, our movement, within the United States, right? So we can put those dates there. But it, it's still progressive. It hasn't, it hasn't reached its peak at this point. Any thoughts on that? That makes sense to you? Makes perfect sense. <clears throat> I would have to agree that it has not reached its peak. Right. So, so we see the King of the South right now in the midst of this battle between the King of the North. And, and now when it, when it does so, when he hath taken away the multitude, and, and we need to look at that multitude, this 1995, right? So, um, I mean, this word itself, I mean, I mean, it's got, you know, what we would call a date, 1995. It's, you know, it's like, You know something within our history. It's a number we would think of that as as a date. Okay, so we got this this Hebrew number. I'm just trying to get this here to work. Now this word, uh, Hammon. Now, anybody recognize anything about this word, Hammon? Well, it's not related to Haman. So it. Um, uh, um, pa, mem, uh, and uh, vav and nun. H a m o n. Okay, yeah. So it means murmur, roar, crowd, abundance, tumult, sound, uh, confusion, great number, abundance, wealth. Does does any of this sound? Like, because this great multitude is, is representative of the army of the King of the North. Now, when we look at Trump, what is, what is one of the criticisms the left has of Trump? He is a what kind of president? Populist, so They right? call, called him a populist, yeah. So can you see that this represents, this name this this word, Haman, represents populism. It represents a crowd, right? What we see at Trump rallies, what we saw on January 6th, 2021. Okay. You may you may have a good point with that, but it, am I understanding it right that Hebrew one nine nine five is derived from Hebrew one nine nine three? Yes, Hama, which means to make a loud sound, like the English word hum, by implication being great commotion or tumult, um, to rage, war, moan, clamor. Um, and then it's translated all different kinds of ways to make a tumult. I mean, so it kind of represent what happened on January 6, 2021. And, and so somebody could say, well, you know, that could be raffia, you know, in a symbolic sense, though, though, you know, this isn't really over yet because it says when he hath taken away the multitude, 
his heart shall be lifted up, and he shall cast down many ten thousands, but he shall not be strengthened by it, right? So if we put this to January 6, 2021, as the symbolic date of Raphia, not saying that, you know, they're completely defeated yet, but we can say that he takes away this multitude, his heart, that is the heart of the king of the south, shall be lifted up, um, and uh, this word, um, I'm just seeing if there's anything about this. This is the word room. That's what I was wondering. So, so this word room, what is this word room? Remember, we have a word sir and a word room. Right. So what is room? Where do we see this in Daniel chapter Daniel chapter, I believe this is one in Daniel chapter 8, if I'm getting it right. So in Daniel chapter 8, I know we have it in uh, in 1136, and the king shall do according to his will. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the gods of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done. Um, now it's so that it has here as the word exalt, right? We also have it in, you see, so we get exalted, exalt, high. Um, Daniel 11 36 exalt, Daniel 11 12, it occurs, which is the one we're looking at, and then. Yeah, Daniel 8.11, right? <clears throat> so in Daniel 8.11, it says, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of, of the host, and by him, or really from him, the daily was taken away or lifted up and exalted, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. So we know that in this case, in this verse, uh, the one that magnifies himself uh, even to the prince of the host is Papal Rome. And from him, the daily was lifted up. And that's going to be taken by papal Rome, right? The daily paganism is going to be lifted up and exalted. And the place of his sanctuary was cast down and a host was given him against the daily, right? So, so that word room means to exalt or lift up. Does it mean to remove in this verse? Now, we do have the word sir, that's going to be used later, right, in Daniel chapter 11. So, so this, um, and, and that's where the application then to Second Thessalonians would be correct. But if we tried to take this one in connection with Second Thessalonians, we would get a wrong impression. Miller didn't quite understand the, the word here. But he did use his rules by comparing the English words taken away. Okay, so if we get back to 11.12, and we say, he hath taken away the multitude, um, and his heart shall be lifted up. So here, this taken away is nasa, so that's to lift or advance. Um, uh, so this one has a lot of different ways in which it could be understood. Um, so he's taken away the multitude. So this isn't just, um, he has to, he has to win over the multitude, I guess, is the way that I'm looking at it. Right. So this isn't just like a military battle where you uh, defeat them because this multitude is a mob and uh, the king of the south is going to if, if we're reading this verse correctly, he's going to take away the multitude. Now, there are other ways we could try to interpret this. I mean, normally we're just going to look at this historically as the king of the south. That's going to be Egypt. 
It's going to win this battle against the king of the north. And the taking away of the multitude is, is like the conquering of it. Uh, but remember here in Hebrew, um, when we have these he's and his and him, uh, it's not always clear who it's referring to. So the question is, when he hath taken away the multitude, who is the he that hath taken away the multitude? Should this be the king of the south who has taken away the multitude, lifted up the multitude? Because we have two options. It could be the king of the north or the king of the south. I would say it's the king of the south. Okay. So if he lifts up the multitude, this isn't about the conquering of the multitude. This is about lifting up the multitude. Um, right? And because this word here, it means to lift, right? Just as room means to be high. So he's going to lift up the multitude and his heart, uh, Labab, which is the sound the heart makes, um, uh, shall be lifted up, room, and he shall cast down, uh, that word's nafal. Um, so it means lots of different things, but basically he shall be overthrown or he shall overthrow many ten thousands. So we've got to look at this. This word here, uh, ribo, uh, a myriad, it's from 7231, it's 7239. But he shall not be strengthened by it. So that would be the king of the south is not strengthened um, by this act, right, of casting down many tens of thousands, right? So, so what is this action here historically? What happens uh, when Egypt conquers uh, the Seleucid Empire, king of the north? So here's what Uri Smith says. Ptolemy lacked the prudence to make good use of his victory. Had he followed up his success, he would probably have become the master of the whole kingdom of Antiochus, but after making only a few threats, he made peace that he might be able to give himself up to the uninterrupted and uncontrolled indulgence of his brutish passions. Thus, having conquered his enemies, he was overcome by his vices, and forgetful of the great name which he might have established, he spent his time in feasting and sensuality. His heart was lifted up by his success, but he was far from being strengthened by it, for the inglorious use he had made of it caused his own subjects to rebel against him. But the lifting up of his heart was especially made manifest in the transactions with the Jews. Coming to Jerusalem, he offered sacrifices. And when Desat was desirous of entering into the most holy place of the temple, contrary to the law and religion of the Jews, but being restrained with great difficulty, he left the place, burning with anger against the whole nation of the Jews, and immediately began against, began against them a relentless persecution. In Alexandria, where Jews had resided since the days of Alexander, enjoying the privileges of the most favored citizens, 40,000, according to Eusebius, uh, 60,000, according to Jerome, were slain. The rebellion of the Egyptians and the massacre of the Jews certainly were not calculated to strengthen Ptolemy and his kingdom, but were sufficient, rather, to ruin it almost totally. Now, so if we are going to make a parallel to that time, and if this history is, is the best way to describe what this verse is, has wokeism conquered to some degree Protestant uh, America? That is, are Protestant churches woke? Starting to take over, yeah. Right. Okay. So this would be lifting up the multitude. Mm -hmm. But is this going to turn against wokeism because of uh, the type of persecution that they're doing against Christians. That people are going to see their freedoms being taken away. And and that, that wokeism, the church has invited it in, sort of like we're going to, we're going to go with the tide. You know, we don't want to be looked down upon by the world. But do you think that's going to change how woke people look at Christianity? Nope. 
they're still going to be persecuting Christians. They're still going to be treating Christians badly, right? And 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 they're not going to just settle for the for what they have. They're going to want uh, Christians basically to bow completely to wokeism, you know, just for lack of a better uh, word to use. Does that make sense? Or not? Is there any other way we could characterize this? You're making a logical point. Okay. So when we have the king of the north shall return and set forth a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with much riches. In those, and in those times there shall be many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall, right? So we know that whatever, however we look at the south and the north, that there is going to be, once the South wins, and the way that Jeff looked at it back in 2017, you know, we were looking at what was happening in, in Russia. And the idea was, um, you know, the Russians were going to be, win some war against the United States, and then they were going to start all this persecution in Russia of Christians and, and, and basically repeat this history in a more literal sense than how we're applying it here now. Um, and then the United States would come in and conquer Russia, and that would be the end of the King of the South. Right? But but what we have here is is definitely broader than that. Um and, and when we're talking about the King of the North, this is you know Christianity, right? Protestant Christianity, not just in the United States, but everywhere, is has definitely been It's succumbed to the, gu the guiles of um, wokeism, right? So these philosophies, even if Christians aren't wholeheartedly behind it, it's definitely pretty hard if your church is going to censure you if you uh, make, you know, remarks that are seen as hateful, right? And so you see all kinds of things happening. We see wokeism coming in and conquering not just churches, but all kinds of institutions, whether they're corporate bodies, whether they're, uh, uh, you know, other kinds of institutions, such as educational institutions or hospitals or, um, you know, professional organizations. We can see that, that the King of the South is conquering those, right? And it's putting itself in a position that ultimately is going to weaken because the philosophy itself is intolerant, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nothing more intolerant uh, than something that's disguised as tolerance, right? So, so we can see that at some point, many shall stand up against this whole philosophy. And, you know, so when, when we looked into the World Economic Forum, one of the things I saw about it was that um, they're extremely juvenile. I mean, they're not, they're not people who are ever going to successfully accomplish anything other than destruction, right? Um, when we look at... Uh, the deconstructionist postmodern thought that tries to uh, destroy every every sense of of there being some kind of objective reality that we have to live in this completely subjective world um, where the whole basis, the foundation of society is undermined. At some point, people are going to rise up against it, even if it's not even if for the only reason they rise up against it is economic. You know, that the economy is being destroyed, that society is falling apart. And and I think that's part of what's happening here is that uh, the principles of of postmodernism that's taking over this world, this secular, uh, you know, communistic uh, 
um, what fake human rights uh, type of thing, it, it won't be able to to exist. It can't build a solid society. You know, Klaus Schwab's idea of you know by twenty thirty everybody, you know, you won't own anything and everybody will be happy. It is pie in the sky idealism, right? Just it just can't work. And so, even though people are embracing these ideas, I mean, in Canada they want to have like a living wage. Everybody gets a living wage, so you know nobody has to work. Um, I mean, these definitely are not sustainable ideas. So, so then we would see that on a worldwide scale, that that philosophy would end up being defeated. Now, that doesn't mean that that philosophy disappears, takes on other forms, but all of these these powers, the papacy, that's the robbers of thy people, Rome, um, the king of the north, whatever that symbolizes, these different institutions, Christianity, and the UN and its secularism, they are all going to be united in persecuting God's people. Right. And that's why when we keep reading on in these verses, we can see the exact parallel to Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. Right. Be it the glorious land, all of those things. And and so um, so when we when we look at Paneum here, so the king of the north shall come, shall cast up a mount, um, and take the most fenced cities, and the arms of the south shall not withstand neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. But he that cometh against against him shall do according to his will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land, by which his hand shall be consumed. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of women, corrupting her, but she shall not stand on his side now for him. And this shall turn his face, and after this shall he turn his face unto the isles and shall take away many. But a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease without his own reproach. He shall cause it to turn upon him. Then shall he turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. Then shall stand up in his estate, a razor of taxes, taxes and glory of his king, of the kingdom. But within a few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. Now we know as we go through this, we're making a transition from the kingdom of Greece, which we're saying is this line that represents um our line, and then we're moving into Rome itself, right? And and so this would then be another repeat of history, another way of examining this line. First, we did it under Persia, now we're under Greece, and then under Rome, right? So all of those repeats of history, all of those those histories are typifying our line. And but we can see that this Daniel eleven eleven is is tied to what we have here. So instead of this being like the whole thing being repeated, it's actually expanding. It, it's a separate line, but it's interwoven with with this line that we had before, because this is going to be the Sunday law, and then this is going to repeat that history with more detail but still tied to our history. And so we have to figure out, you know, where we're going to switch that to Rome. We know Rome comes in uh, at least by verse 16, right? Even though it's there in uh, verse 14. Okay, so how do we do this now? How do we proceed with understanding this? We've looked at the numbers here. Um, what should we do? 
So we can agree that this is raffia. And this is going to be pinean. So how do we tie this with our lines? Any thoughts on what we've just discussed? When we were going through this yesterday, weren't we placing Paneum with the arrival of the second angel? Or do I okay. have that mistaken? Okay, so, so, so that's a good question. Um, now, when we talk about what line are we dealing with? I mean, Paneum is the second angel's message, right? Agreed. But but it's it's not the arrival of the second. It's it's the midnight cry. It's the empowerment of the second angel. Okay. Raphael is midnight, right? Now, part of the confusion comes. So we have eleven nine nineteen, and we say that's Raphael. Well, eleven nine nineteen is the arrival of the second angel's message, right? Just like September eleventh is. But it's also it's also the first angel's message, right? Well, no, I guess it's the it's the arrival of the second message because it's it's the first day of the first month. So we say Raphia is the first day of the first month, because that's what eleven nine represents. That's what nine eleven represents. So so the question is if if Paneum is the empowerment of the second angel. Because it's not the arrival of the second angel, Raphia would be. Um, but it's still existing in that history. So that means, could we say that the history that we, we have just passed through, that we are still in, but the 777 days marking the beginning of Raphia, that Paneum, the empowerment of that, um, I, don't, I don't know, I don't know how we would do that. I guess, could we say that that history is Raphia and that Paneum is everything that July 18th was symbolizing is going to still happen? And that Paneum would be marked by what? What, what event would mark Paneum? What what would we have to look for? Well, I think it could involve involve the bombing of Na Nashville and Islam being really in, really involved with that because Islam right now is pretty riled about what's what's happening in Gaza. Okay, so so we we sort of attach. Okay, if if we look at the line that Jeff has had, because I got to keep what you're you're thinking in mind. So if we look at the line that Jeff had had for a long time. We have 9 11, midnight, midnight cry, the Sunday law, right? So we have this line, and uh, I'm just going to put it up here so we can just easily, more easily visualize it, right? So we have this line, 9 11 to the Sunday law. And then we talk about, well, Rafi and Paneum, right? So we started to say, well, midnight, midnight cry back in 2016, December uh, 17th, you know. Jeff is going to receive this message. He's going to present it. Um, Rafi and Paneum are, are midnight in the midnight cry. And then in January of 2017, he's going to say, there's going to be a pandemic between Rafi and Paneum, right? Between these two way marks. Okay, so as we move through time, we start to say, well, 
uh, we can actually label this. And what we're going to do is label this date of midnight. We're going to label it with 11, nine, right? So we're going to put 11, nine here. So I'm going to do it this way just so we can see it. So this 11, nine is going to be uh, labeled, right? We get a date attached to it. And then we're going to uh, label this one. Um, no, July 18, 2020. Let's do it like that. Right? So now we have the midnight cry, we have midnight. But we know that midnight, that is 11 9, is also the arrival of the second angel. That is, this 11 9, or this 9 11 and this 11 9 are really the same way mark. That is, we just didn't recognize that we were zooming into a way mark and expanding it. So we still haven't totally figured out how to to sort out these lines. There's some things we're uncertain about because we've had lots of different midnights and different midnight cries. But this one here, we can see that that's what we had in 2019, right? We're gonna have Raffi and Paneum. We have the dates. We're expecting certain events to occur. But we can now see, well, this Raffi is actually not just midnight, in, in 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 here this this date is not just midnight but it's also the first day of the first month right and so we could say well do we just move raffia over to july 18 and move Panium over to the sunday law which is what we tried to do right in 2019 as especially as november 9th passed okay november 9th must be raffia it's a period of time Raffi is going to go from November 9th, 2019 to July 18, 2020. And then Panium will go from um, July 18, 2020 to December 25th, 2021, right? But what if this is in this bigger scope that Raffia is in a sense starting here on November 9th, 2019, but it's progressive. That each of these way marks in our line is of seeing um, the South conquering the North. And we can see that obviously with COVID-19, the pandemic beginning there, can we see that the King of the South is coming in after the, the King of the North has gathered its multitude, right? Its multitudes, right? And uh, the King of the South is going to come and conquer them. And it's going to do this progressively through this history. So when we get to, um, you know, to our time where we're, we're on, we can see that the King of the South is definitely conquering and taking over that territory of the King of the North. But that so that we're still kind of in Raffia, and, and we can mark different events in different lines as Raffia. But that's part of this progression of Raphael. An example of this would be the captivity of, of Israel. Israel's captivity first begins with Manasseh in 677. Then Daniel's taken captive in the third year of Jehoiakim in 607. And then Jehoiachin is taken captive in 597. And, and then you have the destruction of Jerusalem with Zedekiah being taken captive and killed. And the destruction of the temple in 586. Now, People have argued, well, where do we start this captivity? Where do we start the 70 years for Babylon? But, but we can see that the progression of that captivity doesn't have just one point in which you say, ah, oh, the captivity began here. Because you, you're going to mark the 70 years and say, well, there's 70 years in Babylon. But there's also 70 years for the temple. There's also 70 years of probation from 677 to 607, Right. So, and you have, of course, the 70 years for Babylon, right, which is staggered two years earlier in its beginning and end from the 70 years in Babylon or at Babylon, right? 
So can we see that maybe this is describing the same type of thing? This progression of raphia happening in our history. Makes sense to me. That which has been, will be, and is. Okay. So, so when we talk about midnight, though, we know that there comes a point where the temple is destroyed and Jerusalem is destroyed and God's people are in captivity, right? So there comes a point where there's something that we could say is midnight, you know, as just like there's something that's going to be the Sunday law, right? That is what we call the Sunday law. But it doesn't mean that we haven't been in the Sunday law prior to that. Because we're just in the time of the Sunday since 9-11. And we're in the time of Raphia since 11-9. Right? Does that seem reasonable? And really with the start of this pandemic that happened that this that this is really when raphia begin even though we have attached to it a date dealing with our movement it's really close in proximity there that you have this pandemic beginning right i mean yeah patient zero officially is you know november 17th but you know there's lots of we, we there's evidence there's obviously people sick before then but we can definitely tie it to this period of time. And by July 18, 2020, we, we definitely are in that pandemic. Okay, so, but it's, it's, it's what's happening worldwide, what's happening at our local level, that's showing that the South is coming against the King of the North. And, and the fortress, what's the fortress of the king of the north? That's, that's the constitution, right? Correct. Okay. So we, so we can see that in that history, that, that we have this repeat in this story of, of the king of the south and the king of the north in, in those verses, um, Basically, I guess you have to say when you start with verse four, right? Um, when when Alexander stands and his kingdom shall be broken, he stands up, and we see that 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 that's going to be marking our history, November 9th, nineteen eighty nine, right? It's going to bring us through this history of this battle of the King of the North and the King of the South. Um. But then this, this re history is repeated in another way, right? The king of the north and the king of the south now being more specifically not the United States and the Soviet Union, but now these world philosophies. Now, there's obviously politics behind it. There's these governments. But there isn't just one government that's the king of the south. I mean, you could try to say, what's the UN? But the UN is really the United Nations, right? Um but it's also entering into the institutions of these countries, to the churches of, that exist. And, you know, what we saw with the BML riots and, um, you know, the Christian response to that because of our compassion and, and buying into the, um, the rhetoric and so forth. You know, many people sided with basically, basically a terrorist organization thinking that what they were doing was, you know, Christian in some way. But these, this, these things are all going to unravel, right? The king of the south is not going to be strengthened by these things. And so these things have been happening through our history. So you can see Daniel 11, you know, is repeating this history, but it's, it's repeating it in a much more cosmic way level much more about ideology in nations or kingdoms
Now, um, when we come back to this on Sunday, uh, one of the things that we're going to deal with, because I'm going to go through chapter two study, um, but one of the things that he deals with when he looks at, he shall be stirred up even to his fortress. Uh, I think it's that one, or he shall, let me see which verse is it. Um think it's there. Um, Got to go back. No, this one, where he enters into the fortress of the king of the north. Um, Daniel 11, verse 7. Now, he applies this to 1798. So, so one of the things that he's doing, which, which I wasn't really aware of, um, so we take this history of of Greece, right? And this is literally, this is a very literal prophecy. There isn't really a lot of symbolic language here. It's pretty pretty straightforward a description of what's going to happen. Now we know that at the at the end of the world, that the king of the north is not Turkey in 1798. And the king of the south is not Egypt, right? This was a mistake the Millerites made, right? Which Uriah Smith iterates, okay? Would, would we agree with that? That the king of the north is not Turkey and the king of the south is not Egypt in 1798. So if that's the case, where do we have the transition? Where do we move from spiritual king of the north to uh, or from literal king of the north to spiritual king of the north didn't we look at it that as happening when in in uh the 2520, the 21260s. So just like with Israel, you have the transition happen from uh, literal to spiritual at the cross, right? And, and in a sense, you have a cross or a counterfeit with the 30 years and, and so forth, that the transition from paganism to papalism represents this transition from literal sacrifices as a counterfeit to uh, spiritual sacrifices as a counterfeit with the papacy, right? So when, so when we get to 1798, we're not dealing with a king of the north that is, is Turkey and a king of the south, it's Egypt, right? So we understand that. But it's based upon this principle. So, so if we're making an application, of Daniel chapter 11, verse 7 to 1798. Is that the history that would we look at that history as typical of what happens to the United States, right? And so when I started looking at his view, I saw problems with it. It is... I don't know if we can actually make that application of Daniel 11, verse 7, that this is talking about when the Pope is taken captive. And so, so we're going to have to discuss that. We're going to have to decide if that interpretation is a valid interpretation. Uh, there's also some other things we have to look at as well, dealing with 252. BC and 246 BC, dealing with some earlier stuff. So we're going to have to go through this again um, and look at what Chow Tu says about, about this history. So, so the way that Chow Tu looks at it, at least from what I've seen so far, and so I want you to think about this before Sunday. Um, so if this is true that this verse 7 represents 1798, then we would have to say, 
when the king of the south, uh, that, that when, uh, let me see here, that's going to be king of the north conquered by the king of the south. Then you have to have the king of the north defeat the king of the south, and that's going to be 1989. But it's not clear to me how he does that. Right? Because he's going to have basically uh, them coming into the fortress of the king of the enter the fortress of the king. She'll deal against them and she'll prevail. And also she'll carry captives in Egypt. So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return into his own land. But his son shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces. And one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Then shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. So this seems to take uh, chapter 10 as being the whole history of the Sunday law, 1989 and so forth. So I, I, I'm going to have to think about that. But there might be some virtue in this. My initial response was, was not, but it might actually help us. So we have to sort through some of what was studied before. So we have to go back and do that. Um, and, and we may see some things that we didn't see. So all I would be saying is that you can take this history, King of the North, King of the South, from Alexander's kingdom being broken up, and you can make an application to, 17, to 1798 and 1989. That seems to me what Chowatu was doing initially. He wasn't making an application in the way that we are to our immediate history. And it, and it could be that both applications uh, provide light. That is, we're just going another level as we make it apply to our history in a more specific way. So I know that's a little bit... Um, uh, a little bit more to think about. So I, I think what we can say is that we have here in this history from November 9th to, to the present, we have a history of what we can call Paneum, or Raphia, pardon me. So we're in the history of Raphia, and Paneum is still future. We wouldn't mark it as July 18, 2020, or December 21st, 2021. It's still future in that context. But it doesn't mean that there isn't a Rafi and Puneum that we can mark in these lines in this way. But it's just that big Rafi and Puneum is a much more cosmic scale. Okay, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful um, for the light that comes from your word. We know that um, without your spirit to teach us, we're left to our own devices, which are insufficient to understand your word, that we need the Holy Spirit that inspired it. And we ask, Lord, that you can continue to help us examine these things that your Holy Spirit can teach us in our personal study as well as when we come together. And we give our hearts to you and ask that you can use us today to your glory. Forgive us for our sins. Help us to trust in you fully and to support uh, one another. Bring us together again to study your word. According to thy will, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.